This happened to me about three months ago. A bit of background about myself. I sadly suffer from chronic pain from a back injury I've had operated on three times. Most of the time I deal with it and live my life, but every few years it starts to really get to me. I go into a bad depression, stop talking to my family, and generally turn into a hermit. When this happens, my family gets worried that I'm going to hurt myself. I have no idea why. I never made an attempt or even said I was planning to and they send me to the psyche ER, at which point they usually put me on a 5150. For those who don't know, that means a three-day hold, and they send me off to the local psych ward. None of this has really bothered me before. I have good insurance, so the place they send me to is basically like a hotel where you can't have shoelaces or touch each other. When they wheel you in, that is the worst part. You're strapped to a gurney, and like me, if you come in the middle of the day, you're wheeled right through the day room, where all the other patients get to stare at you coming in. This might be a good time to describe myself. I'm male, a bit over 6 foot 2, and around 285 pounds, with tattoos covering both arms. And since I've been depressed for months, my beard and hair are out of control, and I look like a generic biker so I generally don't have anyone ever trying to mess with me. I'm very friendly, but unless you know me, I don't look like it. As I've been through all this a couple of times before, I know the gist of what's going to happen. They take all my information, make sure I have no laces or anything with strings, and show me to my room. This psych ward is co-ed, but roommates can only be of the same sex. It also means low security, meaning everyone in here is supposedly non-violent. My only issue with this place is they have people like me who have no mental illness and are just going through a hard time, mixed in with all different levels of people. But in the past two visits here, I've never had a problem with anyone, and I was hoping I would just do my three days and be done. They send me to my room, and the nurse says I'll be roommates with Tim. She starts to say something along the lines of, Tim is, he's a nice guy. Which of course made me a little wary, but we're in a psych ward where everyone in here has some issues. These rooms are basically like any shitty motel room, except a bit bigger with two beds, a bathroom, that annoyingly doesn't have a full door, one desk, and each patient gets their own dresser. It's 3pm, and Tim is sound asleep which in here isn't that weird. Everyone is on different meds that knock them out, or they just have weird sleep habits, so I don't think anything of it. As a matter of fact, after spending hours in the ER, and a couple of hours getting all signed in here, I'm dead tired myself, and I decide to fall asleep, which I do almost instantly. I have no idea how long I slept, but when I wake up, it's pitch black outside, and only the little floor light that you can't turn off is giving the room some light. Tim is sitting up on his bed, doing the psst sound. What's up, man? I'm Brian. Would have said hi earlier, but you were asleep, I said, trying to be as friendly as possible, since it's just easier to get along with everyone in places like this. Yeah, I try to sleep as much as possible, so I don't have to interact with any of the demons. He replied, this should have been a giant red flag and my cue to ask for a new room, but Tim was much smaller than me, and they search you when you first come in, so I had no reason to fear him. So I decided to make conversation with him about said demons, which I found out were all the doctors and nurses to him. After talking to him about this and that for a while, I let him know I'm still really tired and need some more sleep. At which point he says, Okay, and it's nice to finally have a fellow human as a roommate. I took this as a sign that he was okay with me, and I didn't have to sleep with one eye open. I wake up really early for breakfast, since I haven't eaten in 24 hours, and I go to sit down. Tim comes out and sits with me. Besides referring to the nurses and doctors as demons, he seemed pretty normal. We chatted about normal things for a while, until he suddenly stops talking and is staring at something behind me. 
You see her, Jessica. She's an angel. I turn around to see a very gorgeous girl who looks to be in her low twenties, maybe even 18 to 19. She waves and says hi to Tim, and pretty much everyone else in the dining room area seems to be one of those very bubbly girls who goes out of their way to be really nice to everyone. When I look back, he's staring at her a bit too much, so I snap my fingers and say, Hey man, don't freak her out. He gave me a very confused look, like I'd said the most absurd thing in the world to him, and he got very quiet after that. Honestly, I didn't think anything of it, as I had my own shit to deal with. The rest of the day was usual in a place like this. Go to meetings, talk to your doctor, take your meds, but the majority of the time, you're just bored out of your mind. The TV gets four channels, even if one of them was HBO, it was always hit or miss. So I spent the majority of the time just reading books in the day room. While I'm reading my book, Jessica comes up to me, sits down next to me, and she introduces herself. She starts to ask me all kinds of questions about my tattoos, what I'm reading, just basically my whole life story. Like me, she was basically just a normal person having a hard time, no mental illness to speak of, just had bad anxiety that caused her to have panic attacks mainly, since she just started college and she couldn't deal very well with the pressure. We end up talking for a few hours, and I didn't think about it until after, but Tim was walking past us, over and over and over. A lot of people did laps in this place to pass the time, so I really thought nothing of it. I later learned he was basically staring a hole through the back of my head the whole time he walked past me. After talking to Jessica for a while, I tell her I'm going to take a shower before dinner and we can catch up more later. Like I said before, the bathrooms in this place only have half doors, like an old west saloon door, but solid. So when I get out, I can see Tim's legs and socks under the door. What's up, man? Do you need to use the bathroom? I'll just be a minute, I gotta get changed. I say. He doesn't say anything, he just stands there. So I say. Dude, just back up, will you? You're freaking me out a bit. I can hear him breathing really fast and hard now. And these doors don't lock. He could just push it open if he wanted to. Dude, you need to back up. I need to come out. I say. And this is when he starts screaming at me. You're Satan. You're Lucifer. Over and over and over again. I'm really freaking out at this point. If I open this door and beat the shit out of this guy, it's gonna be me who gets a shot in the ass and put into the quiet room. But I don't know what else to do. And even though he's screaming as loud as he can, no nurses seem to be coming out. The doors to the bedrooms in this place are very thick. I'm pretty sure it's because patients scream in the middle of the night a lot, and they don't want other patients being woken up. Which is a nice policy, but it's really putting me into a bind right now. After what seems like ten minutes, but was probably closer to one, and just as I'm getting ready to reenact the bathhouse scene from Eastern Promises, he stops and leaves the room. I get dressed and instantly go find a nurse to tell them what has just happened. I had no idea what they had said to him, but they immediately put me into another room. I don't see him at all during this time, or for the rest of the night, but I am legit freaked out. No one has ever screamed at me, or cornered me, or anything like this before, and I can't sleep at all that night. Since they don't have clocks, I have no idea what time it is. When I hear him from the day room where the nurse's station is, where is he? Why isn't he coming back to sleep? In the same tone he was using when he was screaming at me in the bathroom. I crack my door just a bit, and I can hear the nurse talking to him. You'll see him in the daytime and can talk to him then. Go back to bed, she said. But I have to see him tonight. It's an emergency, he screams. This goes on for another 30 seconds before security finally gets there. I can hear a scuffle, but no way in hell was I going out there to see what was going on. I can hear him yelling still, 
but I can't hear what he's saying, and eventually it starts to fade. He's still yelling, but they're taking him somewhere else. I figured just at the quiet room, which is located on the opposite side of the ward from where my room was. Needless to say, even with him supposedly put in the quiet room, I laid awake the entire night. Morning comes, and my doctor is already there, which I found really weird, since I usually only saw him well after dinner time. He calls me into the interview room to talk. As soon as he sees me, he basically asks for my entire interaction history with Tim. I go over everything, and at the end of it, he tells me not to worry, that Tim has been transferred to a different hospital. He tells me the name of it, and I've lived around here all of my life, and I recognized the hospital he named. It is very hardcore. It's the kind of place where they lock you in a room most of the day. I feel a bit bad, since I know he just thought I was stealing his angel, and he was just yelling at me. Nothing too bad, but whatever. It's also nice to know that I won't have to hit some poor guy in the face for creeping me out. I finish my stay, and I actually feel a lot better about everything. The pain is being better managed, and I'm ready to stop being a hermit. My grandma comes to pick me up, and I think we're ready to leave. But the doctor is there again really early, and my grandma is giving me this look that freaks me out a bit. I'm thinking they're going to make me stay a bit longer. Once again, we go into the interview room. This is where they tell me what really happened that night, which they didn't want me to know before I completed my treatment. That night, Tim came out over and over again to ask the nurse when I was coming to bed. This nurse just kept telling him that he'd see me in the morning without ever telling him I'd switched rooms. Apparently this had gone on for hours before he finally started screaming about it. When he screamed about it and security came, he was moved to the quiet room and given a shot to knock him out. The nurse thankfully called Tim's doctor and told him the situation. His doctor said they better move Tim to the medium security wing, which was just upstairs for a few days until I left. When they went to gather Tim's clothing and other supplies, they found a seven-inch piece of metal that he broke off from the table in the TV room. The TV room has a camera, but it also has windows where you can see the nurse's station, which didn't always have nurses sitting at it. So my guess is he waited until they left and worked on it until he broke it off. I'm 99.9% .9 certain me asking to change rooms is what saved me from being stabbed to death while I slept. And the doctors agreed, which is why he got sent to the more hardcore hospital. Since he never actually attacked me or anything, he wasn't actually charged with a crime, and I have no idea how long he was held in the other hospital. But I'll be a happy man if I never run into him again. Back in 2013, I lived in Providence, Rhode Island, and had moved there for a new job. It was just me living there in a quaint and spacious townhouse with my then four-year-old daughter. We were relatively new to the area and didn't know many people, but we did become familiar with the kind older gentleman who lived next door. His name was Ben. We lived in a connected townhouse with our two units abutting each other. Our street was lined with beautiful floral trees and was quite nice, but Providence is weird in that the conditions of the house and little neighborhoods can vary drastically street by street. We were near a few rough neighborhoods, but I felt relatively safe in my new home. I remember a few nights prior to this specific night, I saw a Facebook post with a safety tip to put your car keys next to your bedside table so if anything ever happens, you can press the alarm and scare off an intruder. I've never been overly concerned about my safety and rarely took advantage of any tips I saw on Facebook, so I'm not sure how or why I suddenly decided to heed this advice. I was reading a book in bed with my light on in my second floor bedroom, 
hours after putting my daughter to sleep when I heard a loud sound outside. I peered out the window to take a look, and I saw nothing. I had taken some melatonin that evening, and I turned off the light and went to sleep. It was maybe a half hour later or so when I was suddenly woken up by what felt like almost an earthquake. The room shook and I heard a loud thud. Half awake, I gasped and sat up, wondering if it was my imagination or if I actually felt something. And I immediately ran to my daughter's room, thinking she had fallen off her bed or injured herself or something. As I swung her door wide open, there she was, sleeping soundly and sweetly. I was so confused. I heard another loud bang, and I had an eerie feeling that something was wrong, but I couldn't figure out what. I grabbed my car key fob and took it downstairs as I nervously inspected the first floor. I swore to myself, if I heard one more sound, I would press the alarm just in case, but I didn't. It was silent after that. I returned to bed and took a while to fall asleep again, but soon shut my eyes. The next day went on like any other day. When I noticed a friend of mine had repeatedly called me in the afternoon, I picked up my daughter from preschool and called my friend back. Did you hear that? He said. No. What? I answered. News outlets were mobbing your street about an hour ago, and the news trucks were even in your driveway. I sat silent, confused. Three men broke into your neighbor's place last night. They tied him up at gunpoint and stole thousands of dollars worth of items. They took off with his car. I immediately fell to my knees and began sobbing. I had heard it all happen. I almost pressed the button. I almost, but I didn't. I sobbed and felt completely unsafe. I asked a friend to come over for the night to stay with us, and it wasn't until the next day that I got a chance to speak with Ben. Ben explained the whole story and told me the cops wanted to talk to me so I could share what I'd heard and experienced. He said the men smashed the window in his basement and entered through there. That's the sound I heard before going to bed. Apparently, the timeline suggested that they saw my light and me peering out of the window, and they waited 30 minutes or so until my light was out to enter the premises. They didn't realize he was home, and since he had gone to bed early that night, it was suggested they cased his place beforehand. He had been asleep when one of them was rummaging through his stuff upstairs in his bedroom, which was directly on the other side of my closets through a shared wall. The sounds and shake I heard and felt were apparently the intruder knocking him down to the ground after realizing Ben was there and cupping his mouth to tell him that if he made another sound, he would kill him. This is why I never heard another sound as I was investigating thereafter. After they tied him up, he remained tied up for over 12 hours and eventually broke free before calling the police. I cried once again and apologized profusely to Ben and I explained what I'd heard and he simply said that as he was tied up, all he could think about was that he was glad that it didn't happen to me and my little girl. I really don't know what I would have done if my daughter and I had to experience that level of trauma firsthand. Ben seemed to be okay considering it all, but it took me so long to feel safe again and for the guilt to subside. They never caught the guys, and I ended up ordering a taser, which was illegal, and I got some mace, and even for the first time in my life, considered getting a gun, but I decided against it. I have been fortunate to never experience anything close to that again, and I certainly don't want to. I'm glad Ben was ultimately okay, but next time, I'll listen to my instinct. It's better to be safe than sorry. For a bit of backstory before we begin, I'm into LARPing, 
And for those who don't know what it is, we basically spend the weekend in the woods dressed as medieval fantasy characters and interact with each other. I go to these events with my friend and my partner, and we meet some more friends when we get there. There are all types of people at these events, but 99.9% .9 are absolute angels. I had yet to meet the 0.1%, but wish I hadn't. Before the event started, a guy called Greg swung by my tent while I was setting it up. My partner and friend were setting up the secondary tent up a path, and they couldn't see me. There were five other people to my right. I had never met the guy before, but as soon as he said hi, I had a bad feeling. He was around 5 foot 10, obese, a neck beard, basically what would fit the description of an incel. He approaches me and asks me if I'm alone. I say no, that I'm here with people, but I don't mention my partner or friend directly. He asks if I'm a gamer, to which I say yes. From then on, he starts rambling on about Ark Survival, which is a game I personally have 3,000 plus hours on. He tells me blatantly wrong information, misnames the dinosaurs, tells me stuff that's impossible to do in the game, even with mods and whatever else. And every time I correct him, I can see he looks to be getting even more annoyed. I end the conversation, saying I have to go back to setting up the tent, and he leaves. Fast forward to around 10 to 11 p.m. The event has started, which means any mention of the real world, such as cars, TV, pop culture, and whatever else, is forbidden by a rule called decorum. We're playing a campfire game with my friends and my partner, and the guy comes by to sit with us. He sits next to me. I move over. He scoots closer. I move over again. He scoots over. Eventually, I get up and sit next to my friend. As we play the game, he keeps referring to the real world and to video games, so we tell him to either leave or to make an effort and speak properly. He leaves. The next day, I go up a trail for fake hunting, gathering resources. As I come back down towards the village, in the middle of the woods with no camps I could hide in, he's there, waiting for me on the trail. He then asks me if I would like to get a coffee or something sometime, to which I answer, no thanks. As we go down the trail, I tell him I have to collect plants for my potions, so if he can excuse me, I'll be going back to the village to leave my bow and collect my basket. I am walking fast. He follows me, grabs my arm, and tells me, I could come with you. You. Me. Alone in the woods, looking for plants. That looks like the perfect scenario. I freak out and walk very fast down the trail to the village. My neighbors see me and look very concerned. They ask if I need help. I tell them, in an honesty, which is a code to say take me seriously. This isn't part of the game, that this guy is being extra creepy and following me. They take their weapons, foam weapons of course, and they tell him to fuck off before they carve him a new asshole. I stay with them for a few minutes before chilling with my friends. Night comes. We're having fun. Stuff is happening in terms of fighting and encounters. Then, at around midnight, I decide to go to the bathroom. At that point, I haven't seen the guy since around 7 p.m. As I come back from the bathroom, in complete darkness, this guy jumps from a bush and pins me against a tree. He tells me he's not proud of me, that I've been leading him on, that he doesn't understand why I would hold another guy's hand and hug three other guys, but not him. I tell him I hold my fiancé's hand, and I do hug my friends, but he's neither. I also tell him to stop the bullshit, in all honesty, to which he answers, but what if, in all honesty, I just want a little kiss, huh? Just a little kiss and then you can go. I yell no and try to get away from him. My friends, who were right on the other side of the bridge separating us, heard me scream. They took their weapons, called upon my neighbors, and around ten people came careening down the bridge to help. The guy let me go and turned to my rescuers, saying he was just interrogating me for information concerning the demons 
Who were our foes in the game? My friends, who have seen this guy be an asshole before, tell him not to move, that they're going to get the owner of the LARP to deal with him. He tried to dissuade them, but my neighbors tell him to sit down, or he'll be visiting Death's altar before he can move. I'm taken away by my fiancé, who's very worried and concerned about what happened. The owner comes, I explain what happened, and he takes Greg outside the play to discuss. From what I heard, he was kindly asked not to come back for future events. So Greg, my medieval stalker, let's not meet again. To begin this story, it's important to understand my dad was never a good father. He lacked all the qualities a normal mentally healthy father would, and we lived in very low income housing. When he was in high school, he was told he was unable to have kids due to a car accident, leaving his bits mangled. Unfortunately, he still could in fact have kids, and in his 20s to 30s, he managed to accumulate 13 kids. Well, 15 now. I was number 13. Even though I lived week on week off custody with my father, it feels like I never really got to know him, nor was I ever introduced to more than one of my father's other kids that were before me. My older half-sister was the only other person I'd ever met. I don't even know her mom. A lot of this memory has been repressed into deep corners of my mind, so details might seem foggy. I'm 21 now, and I've only recently fully acknowledged that it happened. I even confirmed it with my mom. When I was 10, someone entered our apartment. I can't remember what his name was, but he claimed to be one of my father's long-lost children. He seemed to be in his late teens to early 20s, and he asked if he could stay with us for a while while he attempted to get back onto his feet after moving up from California. I'm in Oregon, by the way. He didn't seem to have many belongings, except an old laptop and was rough around the edges. Mid-length hair, light shadow on the face, fairly skinny and tall. My dad was always weird about him though. He told me that this was my brother, he's family, and will be taking my room for a bit while I slept in the living room. What was weird was that my dad would never let me enter my old room. I remember thinking, even though my new brother is kind of odd, he was a really cool guy. We played Minecraft together on LAN. He was a programmer trying to make some Skyrim-like game and showed me everything he had made so far. He stayed with us for around a month. The day he was chased out of our apartment, we were having a Minecraft redstone competition to whoever could make the cooler redstone building. And the next day, we would present what we made and decide who had the better build. Unfortunately, that never came to happen because that night, I'm not sure what time it was, at least past midnight, I heard screaming. It was clearly my father and loud banging coming from the wall over in our apartment. After probably 30 seconds of banging on the couch, I witnessed my father full rage chasing out whoever my brother was as he ran out of the apartment holding a knife. My dad screamed and yelled, and he chased him outside, but as he ran away, my dad came back to make sure we were okay. Much later that night, I went to sleep with my dad sitting in the living room until dawn, guarding the apartment. It wasn't until months later did I find out exactly what had happened that night. Mostly my father's words, and he liked to embellish things, so take this with a grain of salt. Apparently... Whoever was pretending to be my brother went into my father's room late at night and stabbed him in the chest while he was sleeping. My father woke up, and since he had previous military work in the Middle East, I guess sprung pretty quickly into action. As my younger sister was about to get stabbed, my father tackled the man and wrestled him for a bit, beating him senseless, and after a struggle, he managed to get free and run out of the apartment. That's about all I can really remember. Recently, I asked my mom about it, and she basically confirmed the whole story, 
and added some bits in that put it all together. My mom saw the stab wound herself and said my dad never went to the hospital, but instead she patched him up as she's a nurse, plus he couldn't afford it anyway. It wasn't really that bad, she said. I guess at some point after it happened, I also told her about it, which I don't hold any memory of. The police at some point came by and took a look around. The impersonator was wanted in California, Oregon, and Washington for a multitude of crimes. I don't remember his name, so I can't find out if he was ever caught. So, to wrap this up, is there really any good way to wrap this up? Don't let random people into your house. First off, I'm mostly skeptical about most things paranormal. There are definitely some unexplained happenings, but so many hoaxes have tarnished my perception. Please don't take this as an invitation to convince me. I do, however, want to share an experience that I can't explain from this summer. My wife and I were building a pig shelter in July. As we were placing the posts, we were checking level and distance from a foundation post. I was kneeling down and packing the dirt around the post that she was bringing. I mentioned, time to check distance, as the post was pretty secure and grabbed the tape measure. My wife said, one more shovel full. So I put down the tape and heard the sound of the tape retracting. I noticed her shovel was full, and I happened to notice it was mostly white clay. It's not uncommon here, but it was different than the rest of this post. We finished packing the white clay down, checked the level, and went to grab the tape. But it was gone. We searched, and when I say that, I mean we searched. We went as far as to dig down past the white clay. We raked the dirt where I'd been standing, but I hadn't moved more than a foot in any direction. Maybe the force of the tape flung it somewhere. We checked a ten-foot perimeter. Nothing. Under a board? No. It was getting later, still plenty of sun, but I was spent and supper was long overdue. We called it. The next day, we go out to finish and brought a different tape. We took measurements. It's good. We get back to our post. About eight feet from the foundation post, and we began clearing the trench to the next post in line with hands. Almost immediately as we began working, the tape measure appeared. Like we both simultaneously looked a little one way, and then we both looked back, and it appeared in that instance. In shock, I looked up and went to exclaim, The tape! But my wife was already pointing at it. She had the exact same experience that it was barely out of her peripheral, and when she scanned back, it was there. It was the exact spot I put it down, and the spot we raked. The dirt under the tape was still raked. It would have been close to the anniversary of her father's passing in July. He was never at this farm, but her mom had been. Weird. I told this story to my dad, and we deliberated for a few minutes. I said the only logical explanation is that my wife is pranking me. He agreed, but he knows her well, and I saw her face when she first saw that reappeared tape. There is no way. Last night I took some melatonin to get to sleep early. I have an American bully who is scared of everything, so I don't think of her as my protector. I feel that I'm her protector, and I'm fine with that. My boyfriend works late, so she usually barks when she hears the garage open. At 10.55 at night, she started going crazy. At first, I told her to go back to bed. I then heard my doorbell going off excessively and knocking. We never use our front door. Not once have we ever entered through our front door. We use the garage. 
My first thought was my boyfriend's garage opener must be broken or something, but I had no calls or texts from him. My dog was going insane. We live in a gated community, so I don't feel unsafe ever. I go down and my dog is with me. I can see through the peephole because I'm really short. I heard someone screaming, help me, and they were still knocking and using the doorbell. I thought my boyfriend was just playing a trick on me. We have one of those hotel-like locks at the top of the door, so you can open it like two inches without really opening it. I unlocked the deadbolt and turned the doorknob and opened the door. A man was saying, help me, and then started jerking the knob. I screamed, what do you need help with? He wouldn't speak and kept jerking the doorknob while my dog is sounding the meanest I've ever heard. I slam the door with all my strength and lock it back up. I yell, I'm calling the cops. While on the phone, he's still ringing the door and beating at it. 911 heard it. I felt bad because I wasn't sure if they were hurt. Why wouldn't they say something when the door was open? Why didn't my dog's bark face them at all? He stays beating on the door until the cops get there. When they get there, I see them put an elderly man in the back of their car. I find out that it's my neighbor across the street that I've never met and barely seen. Apparently, he has dementia and he got out of his house. I have a feeling of such guilt for calling the police and scaring his wife. I also felt stupid for how scared I was. I watch a lot of crime shows and my boyfriend has an important job. He sometimes isn't home until around 4 in the morning. I immediately thought someone was watching me and knew that I was home alone. I'm not sure if this was the right place to post this, but it was really scary. But now I feel dumb and feel like if it was someone to hurt me, I did the wrong thing by opening the door a bit, even though it was still locked. I just keep telling myself that I did the right thing, because what was I supposed to do, when all I knew was that there was a strange man at my door, acting erratically and trying to get into my house. I feel so bad for his wife, and the cops made him take an ambulance to ER to get checked out. Anyways, that's my creepy encounter for 2022, and hopefully for the rest of my life. While I was in college, my dad came down to help me to move into a new apartment complex. The new place was about five stories high, and each level had an identical layout, with apartment units along indoor hallways, which were accessed from an elevator to the parking garage below. I was the last one of my three roommates to move into the new place, so there was already some furniture and decor with which I was not familiar. This is relevant, I swear. My dad and I were unloading the truck from the garage below, so we would take the elevator to my place on the fifth floor with each load. As we carried my big mattress into the apartment, I had to set it down for a moment to readjust my grip before we went through the door to my new bedroom. That's when I actually looked at my surroundings and thought, Hmm, huh, I don't recognize that couch. And where did that half-empty bottle of Jack Daniels on the counter come from? Right then, I also remembered that nobody else was home, but I could hear the shower turning off and a man's voice timidly say, Hello? From the bathroom. As it dawned on both of us that we were in the wrong unit, my dad just shouts, Abort! Abort! He grabs his end of the mattress and shoves me and the bed back out into the common hallway. We realized we'd gotten off on the wrong floor of the elevator and got into the unit directly below mine. Luckily, we made it back to my floor before the poor guy from the shower ever saw us. Fast forward a couple of months, and I'd kind of forgotten about the whole event. One of my roommates had gotten to know the guys in the unit below us, and they would sometimes come up to our place to smoke her weed. One night, we were all hanging in the living room with Andrew, 
one of the guys downstairs, and it comes up in conversation that we like the great security in our building, because this was a bigger city than any of us were used to. Andrew agreed in general, but he then told us about this one time he totally freaked out, because he was in the shower, and he swears he heard multiple people in his apartment thumping around and talking to each other right outside the bathroom door. He'd always wondered if he hallucinated the whole thing, because when he emerged from the bathroom, nothing was stolen and nobody was there. At that point, I was trying to blend into the terrible 1980s wallpaper as my face turned bright red. My roommates all knew and loved the story of my dad and I breaking into the downstairs neighbor's apartment and then running away like total creeps. Of course, one of my girls doesn't miss a beat and said, Oh yeah, that was Christy and her dad trying to move her mattress into your bedroom. After I explained the whole situation, Andrew said he was ultimately relieved to learn that it wasn't someone with malicious intent, but I was never able to shake my new nickname, Creeper G. So that's the story of how my dad and I were inadvertently the local sketchballs. For a bit of context, at the time, I was being pimped out by my partner. It was early nighttime, and I was getting ready for work. There were ads posted for me on a couple of different sites, and we snagged what we thought could be a big fish. I messaged this John for about half an hour before agreeing on a house call. The house was completely across the city, in a very wealthy neighborhood. The John told me to let him know when I arrived. He was working on his PC in an upstairs room. My partner and I got in the car and drove to the address provided. He always waited nearby while I worked. But when we arrived to this house, we both felt uneasy. I messaged the John once I was in the driveway, but there was no response. I got out and started to approach the door. My partner came with me. The door was large and made of heavy wood with a fancy frosted glass window in the center. When I knocked, I realized it was ajar. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up as I slowly pushed the door open wide. The interior of the house confused me further. I was faced with a short hallway leading into a grand living space. There was a beautiful fireplace in the center, complete with a crackling fire. To my left, I noticed a dark doorway. The strangest of all was the lack of furniture. From the front door where I stood, I could see nearly the entire living room. There wasn't even a single chair. No photos on the wall, nothing but the fire in the fireplace. I stood frozen in the doorway. My partner stepped past me into the house. I started to flee, but curiosity and fear kept me locked in place. My partner stepped forward and looked into the doorway to the left. He recoiled a bit and shouted, Hello? Hello? He turned to me and shoved me out of the doorway. And at this point, I found my legs again and we sprinted to the car. We drove in stunned silence for a moment until we stopped at an all-night pharmacy. I asked softly, What was in that room? He said, very slowly, an air mattress, with two people on it, sleeping, I hope. I used to date a girl who I would go see every night after I got off of work. I worked until midnight. I would stay at her house until about 1 or 2 a.m., Sometimes as I left her house, she would follow me in her car and stop at a nearby all-night grocery store. I always begged her not to, but she always said she'd be fine. Sometimes I would wait in the parking lot until she came back out, and then we'd go our separate ways. Sometimes I wouldn't. So one time I felt ill. So as we left, she said, Just go straight home. I'll be fine. I always am. But for some reason... 
I felt like that's the night I needed to be there. She thought I went straight home. I was in the parking lot as she pulled in, but she didn't see me. As she walked in, a shady looking guy was walking out. She ignored him, but he looked back at her about three or four times. He then gets into his truck, and another guy is in there, and they talk through the window for a minute, looking back at the store a couple of times. The second guy gets out of the truck, gets something out of the back of it, and then they both head back into the store. I couldn't be sure they were going to do anything, but hell if I was going to take a chance. I go into the store too. I see them going past every aisle, and then motion to each other like, there she is. So I walk a bit faster to catch up. I turn into the aisle just as they're approaching her. They're looking at each other. From behind I yell, hey. They both turn, and so does my girlfriend. I brush by them and give them a look. I had some muscle back then, and I was also six foot four. And then I say, hey guys. They nod awkwardly as my girlfriend says to me, what are you doing here? I kiss her and make up some story about wanting to buy aspirin. The two guys leave. I never told my girlfriend that story. I don't know why. I kind of felt like a superhero to myself. We dated about two more years after that. I don't know what they were going to do with her, but I'm sure it was nothing good. I live in Italy. In nursing school, I had to do rotations in different hospital wards. During my last year, I was assigned to the post-op ICU. Our last rotations were focused on emergency and intensive care. During almost every night shift, and on some of my day shifts, I can feel what can only be described as a ghostly presence, and I kind of saw it in a reflection on the glass panel of a door in the unit. After a month, Almost a month and a half of my rotation, I was close enough with my nurse trainer to ask about what I saw and proceeded to describe the figure I thought I saw. Well, I wasn't prepared for what the trainer and the other nurses in our squad told me that day. When the hospital opened this unit, one year before my time there, the first one to be admitted was a young guy, somewhere in his 30s. He suffered severe polytrauma resulting in severe brain damage that put him in an irreversible coma. The guy died like 10 months of being kept alive by the machines. According to nursing staff, he was haunting the unit, not maliciously, and a lot of patients, especially those who had NDEs, reported seeing him. I'd never met him in person, nor have I ever seen a photograph or knew about him beforehand. The creepiest thing of all is that during my rotation, his mother, who I was told was part of a strange and extremely religious cult-like congregation, came by, asking if it was possible for her and the pastor of said congregation to visit the room and bed where her son had lived and died, because she said she can feel, from her house and not being in the hospital, that her son wasn't able to move on in afterlife and was stuck on Earth, more specifically in that room and unit. Some months after her visit, our sightings and feelings of him suddenly stopped. We had other paranormal or eerie things happen in that unit, but nothing we could associate with him. I later discovered that almost everyone who worked in that unit had the same experiences both with this presumed ghost and with other entities. This happened like six to seven years ago now. I played soccer for one year in community college after high school. I knew this guy because he worked for the athletics department. He was another student. Tuesdays and Thursdays, I had a one-hour gap between classes. This guy noticed me in the library. He asked what I was doing there. I told him I had an hour-long gap, 
and he started coming regularly to hang out. I didn't mind because he seemed like a normal guy. He wasn't waiting for anything, but he just wanted to hang out. He brought me little gifts a few times, like chocolate and stuff. He was being a little too sweet for someone I barely knew. I didn't think about red flags. With the gifts, I remember he always downplayed it. He'd be like, they had extra Kit Kat bars today in the office, do you want some? He never said that he purposely bought a Kit Kat for me. I know a lot more about boys now than I knew back then. I think he knew that buying me gifts would be too much, but he still wanted to do it without doing it. The soccer season for us ended before Thanksgiving. The only teams that kept playing after that were going to the playoffs, not us. After Thanksgiving, we had finals. In that brief period after the soccer season and before Thanksgiving, he asked me about my classes for second semester. To be honest, I hadn't been really organized with my course registration, and I honestly didn't know. Also, the counselors were completely useless. I didn't tell him that, but I remember saying I didn't want to have another gap hour like this because it wasted so much time. I don't think he was happy to hear that. He also asked if I would play another season, and I said no to that. I needed to manage my time better, and playing soccer every day was not helping. I think my mistake was that I just said too much, and unfiltered. I used to do that a lot back then, saying too much without thinking about how it can affect other people's feelings. That was on the last Thursday before Thanksgiving, so no more hour gaps to hang out anymore. We had Thanksgiving break. We took finals, and we had winter break. Everything was great. Winter break was when the real problems started. In the mornings, this guy literally showed up outside my house while sitting in his car. The first time, I didn't believe it was actually him. The second time, I checked, and it was. By then, it was really clear that we both knew what was going on. He was stalking me. And that wasn't all. I posted on my Instagram story sometimes about places I was. This guy literally showed up there several times, like girly stores at the mall where he had zero business being. He did lots of things like that. He also started pointing his phone at me like he was taking pictures. That was even weirder. I basically stopped using social media over this. After winter break continued, when my parents were at work, this guy came during the afternoon, too. I called the cops a few times. They went and tried to talk to him. He basically told them he wasn't going to talk, and that was it. I think the cops wanted to help, but they could never do anything about it because he was careful not to break the law. Like he didn't trespass, he didn't make threats, he didn't show weapons or anything else. I have no idea what he's doing now. My guess is that he gave up. Maybe his little obsession kind of became old, and he found other things to pay more attention to. At least, I hope so. But if he still comes by, I have no idea. I think the most challenging thing is that I couldn't tell my parents, since I knew they would completely freak out. When I was 18, I was living in a small town. I was friends with the ratty skaters around, and they helped me connect with this guy who sold weed. He was 29 at the time, and gave me pretty good deals, and lived nearby. I wasn't driving at the time, so this was convenient for me. His name was Max. Max always struck me as a weird guy, but I honestly quite liked his weirdness. Not in a romantic way or anything, but I like weird people. We had normal weed buying interactions that never lasted more than 10 minutes. Buy some weed, maybe smoke a bowl, that's it. He'd often tell me he could drop it off at my house, but I never let him, because as I said before, he was weird. I wasn't afraid of him, but I was definitely aware that he and his offers to deliver were weird. One day in May 2018, 
I was invited to a bonfire by the same ruddy skaters that introduced me to this guy. I had no idea he'd be there, nor was it important to me at all. I brought the guy I was dating at the time. I said hey to everyone, including Max. We stayed for a couple of hours, and some of them played some music on their guitars. Nearing the time I was leaving the bonfire at around 11 p.m., Max was getting upset about something, and he threw his guitar in the bonfire. I didn't know what he was angry or upset about, and I paid no mind to it. This happened as I was leaving with the guy I was dating. I went to bed and woke up to paragraphs on paragraphs of crazy texts from Max, ranging from 1 a.m. to 5 a.m., like a constant stream of texts stating things such as, You know how much I loved you. You're cruel. He would go back and forth between saying, I would give you the world if you'd let me, and you really do deserve him though. He said really scary things like, you are a predator and should be snubbed out, just wait, with a winky face, and you are stuck. I will either love you or hate you to the fullest extent my powers behold. Right now, I pray the worst death on you and that fuckboy bitch. To top it all off, he said, Losing you is like losing a mother to me. And he told me to tell him I never loved him. And that I wouldn't hear from him again if I did. So that's what I did. I said, I never loved you. Do not message me again. And I left it at that. I didn't get a response. Nor did I care to get one. Max had never expressed any romantic interest. Asked me out or anything. This was all out of nowhere and he was 11 years older than me. I was barely 18. That night, he cut his long hair off and posted photos naked on Facebook, curled up in a fetal position, talking about being a statue of shame. It's as if he had a breakdown, but I had no intention of causing that, and didn't think I would even offend anyone by bringing this guy I was seeing. Everyone else seemed to like the guy I brought. About a week later, Max texted me pretty late at night and asked if I'd seen the flowers he spread along my sidewalk, saying that he stole every flower in the vicinity of my neighborhood that night. I asked how he knew where I lived and said I hadn't seen the flowers, so he must have had the wrong house. I also told him he shouldn't do that as I never felt anything for him and so on. He told me that he'd heard I lived on the same block as another one of the skater guys we were both friends with, and he wasn't wrong. The skater guy I lived by was on the other side of the block, and I never walked that way, so I never saw the flowers. I blocked his number and didn't hear from him again for weeks. Weeks later, I woke up after a rough night, and there were lots of flowers on the sidewalk right outside my house, along with a little bouquet at the top of my walkway. I was pissed. I wasn't scared yet, and stupidly, I unblocked his number and texted him, asking why the fuck there were flowers outside of my house. This confirmed that this indeed was where I lived. I still to this day feel so stupid for texting him and making it known that after weeks, he had found my house. He responded, saying, Hmm... Sounds nice. Twas me. I bitched him out basically and blocked his number again. About a week later, I was out of town. My roommate texted me a photo of a heart with a peace sign inside of it and my name written under it, drawn in chalk outside of our house. When I got back into town, I went straight to the courthouse and began the process of getting a stalking order against him. When I left the courthouse, I went to Max's work and told him he needed to stop this behavior and that he was stalking me. He looked me in the eyes with no facial expression and said, If you don't leave, I'm calling the cops. I got angry and said, Call the cops. I was just talking to them about you and left his work in a rage. Soon after this, I began driving again. I once drove by him and he noticed it was me. The next day, I woke up with my car covered in flowers. I presented my case to the judge 
and she put the stocking water in place. He was served with it by police officers, and I thought that was that, and that he wouldn't be bothering me again. I was wrong. After the stocking water was served, he made several other chalk messages on my sidewalk, left random gifts for me like chalk, and beheaded my little pony heads on beer bottles. I always brought these things to the police station, but they said I needed to catch him doing it, take a photo, or get a security camera. So I got a security camera, and really hoped I would catch him. It turned out, my security camera was stupid, and I couldn't just watch the videos it took, but I had to skip through second by second by hand. It was an impossible task. I was terrified of leaving my house at night at this point. I never had my curtains open anymore, and I was so frustrated that my livelihood was being taken away from me. Ultimately, I unblocked his number in hopes that he would text me, directly violating the stalking order, and after a few days, it worked. He sent me a weird text, something like, Forgive me. We are charming. This is harming. Let us try again. By now, it's September 2018, and he finally goes to jail. He's facing up to a year in jail, and has to stay there until our court date. I finally start calming down. I'm able to go outside at night, even if just to get in my car. I let myself have my curtains open sometimes. I'm starting to feel alive again. Right when I start feeling secure in my small town life again, Someone posted bail, and he was released after only three months in jail, and I went back to living in fear. We still had court dates coming up, and I was optimistic that he would serve more time for ruining my life for so long. His lawyer kept pushing the court date back to gather evidence, and after about six months of pushing it, the state decided they wouldn't do anything more and they basically closed the case. I had moved out of town three plus hours away at this point, so he didn't actually have an option to continue this behavior. Living in this new place, I feel safe. I can walk at night and don't have to have my curtains closed all the time. It's been over a year since they decided to close the case. About a month ago, he began responding to my friend's Instagram stories, friends that live here in this new town telling them how fond he is of me and stuff like that. I have always had him blocked, but my Instagram isn't private, so he must have found them that way. I have since changed my account to private, and he hasn't messaged any more friends of mine. I refuse to be fearful now, the way I was then. He will never find where I live, or where I work now. However... My life is forever changed after this experience. I will always be more aware of people and their weird energy. I will always close my curtains early in the evening and make sure all the windows and doors are locked. I will always live in a bit of fear. Maybe not of him, but of it happening again. He ruined my life for a year. I truly wish he'd gotten that time in jail. He deserves it. I moved a lot growing up. By the time freshman year of high school came around, I'd moved seven times or so. I was about a year and a half into my most recent move. I'd found a pretty close group of friends in middle school, and we all went to high school together. I met him through one of those close friends. They were in band together, and even though he was almost four years older than us, we welcomed him into our group. Sam was easily twice my size, tall and heavy set, and originally kind of intimidating, although I was never afraid of large men before him. Lesson learned. I had a kind of bad home life, and I spent as much time as I could at school, sometimes hanging around the school campus until six or seven at night with this friend group. Three of us lived in the same direction, and we could walk the half-hour trip together until our paths split. 
One slightly colder evening, Sam offered to walk me home since the others had gone home already. I just thought he was being a gentleman. He mentioned something from a previous move when he lived in California. He didn't walk a friend home, and something horrible happened. He left it at that, and I let him walk me home. We got a lot closer after that. We bonded over both living in California and exchanged numbers. He would message me late into the night about his depression and self-harm, and I just wanted to help. A few months later, he tried asking me out. It was this big romantic gesture. He learned a Disney song on the ukulele and sang to me in the cafeteria, but I was already dating someone, and when I turned him down, he got angry. A freaky, quiet, twitchy kind of angry. I felt so bad. I started seeing him everywhere. We were still friends. We still hang out in groups, but I would pass him on the street walking somewhere, and a few minutes later, I'd see that he changed directions and had started to follow me. He would walk me to classes by following me in passing period at a distance. I started to minimize the group time we spent together, and he would follow me more. I had friends meet me at each class and walk me to my next one because I felt so unsafe. He knew where I lived, too. Then he started to talk, not to me, but to my mutual friends about that one girl in California who he tried to walk home. At first, she just shared my name, some crazy coincidence. Then she had the same brown curly hair and blue eyes and every time he rambled about her, she became more and more like me. And then he said what happened. Over literal weeks, this fantasy evolved. They were walking home, and they were jumped by some guy with a knife. It was a robbery gone wrong on her birthday, January 24, which was also my birthday. She died horribly, and he couldn't react in time. She bled out in his arms. Sarah, who has brown curly hair, blue eyes, my name, my birthday, and sounds just like me, bled out in his arms. Each retelling added more and more detail, and this guy with his sick fantasy about my death would follow me around and knew exactly where I lived. My boyfriend was abusive, mentally and physically, but I stayed as close to him as I could whenever I could, because if the worst happened, I knew for sure he could throw a punch. And I never felt safe at school, or in our little town walking home from school in the dark. One day at school, he had a breakdown, freaked out and ran out of the school in a panic. I was sent after him, and I found him curled up on the floor. I got closer. I knew about his anxiety and depression, and my safety aside, I wanted to make sure he was okay. It was then that he told me this horrifying story that I had been hearing from mutual friends with added details. We had been walking home from a concert in California. We passed a dark alley, and a homeless man came out with a rusty knife and asked for anything valuable. I fumbled for my phone, I didn't have anything else on me, and he thought I was calling the cops. He stabbed me, once, twice, again and again, and Sam stood there horrified. He saw red, and grabbed a broken glass bottle near my body, and attacked the homeless man. He killed him with his own knife. He told me he killed someone. My stalker killed someone. It didn't matter how messed up he was anymore. I didn't care if it was a fantasy or real. I didn't care how it would affect his mental health anymore. I wanted to go to the police. I was scared for my life. My friends convinced me to go to the school counselor first. That morning we went and told them everything. The stalking, the stories, how he admitted to murder, and that was the reason they moved from California. How I was afraid for my life and wanted to call the police. The counselor didn't take us seriously. 
she went to the principal, and the principal, not a mental health expert, called Sam in to talk about the accusations. The principal then informed me that he did not think that Sam had any kind of mental illness, or that I was in any danger. And that was that. I lost faith in adults, gave up on going to the police. I stayed with my friend, walking me in between classes, hiding behind my abusive boyfriend, and looking behind me every step of my walk home that year. The counselors ended up gaslighting us, to the point where this all feels like a fever dream now, and I would think it was made up if it weren't for my journal entries recording the events and my growing panic and the similar stories from my friend group. So Sam, let's not meet again. Our neighbor provides so much entertainment for us, we've set up a bar overlooking the front of our house, which we've called Shenanigans, since that's what we get to watch from our bar stools. He's an on-off drug addict who finds it impossible to live alone, so he invites a series of other addicts and dealers to live with him. They stay there for a few months until there's a huge fight, or a series of them, and then they move out again. In the three years we've lived here, We've had the police turn up most weeks. We've had several people overdose, and we've had multiple people using drugs whilst sitting in their cars in our driveway. There have been two kids living there for a few months each. I have had to contact Child Protection about the both of them. They've both moved out now, and I think about them constantly. I hope they're doing okay. Both are absolutely adorable kids, and hearing the treatment one of them received from his mother makes me cry every time I think about it. The other one was talking about ending it all at eight years old. My heart is broken knowing I can't help them any further. The thing is, our neighbor is lovely. He's just very lost and broken, and we've tried so hard to be supportive to him, particularly when he's going through another breakup or relapse. He means well. I got headlights from hugging him for a long time once, but he was just so sad and having horrible withdrawals. I called the police one time for a welfare check because he had just discharged himself, against advice, from hospital following an overdose, and when I saw him the next day, he was a mess. I was so scared he'd overdose again, so I called the police to come with the crisis team. They did, and I was so worried I destroyed our good relationship. But the police came over afterwards and said he'd actually thank them for coming. He wanted me to know he appreciated that someone was looking out for him. I hope so much that he comes through all this and he finds the help he needs. But sadly, he's showing signs of having relapse again right now so I'm not sure it'll be any time soon. I work in a hospital, and I think I saw a ghost. I was wheeling a trolley of paperwork down the hallway. I saw a woman standing in the hall. There was no one else around, very rare. And the second I saw her, I got goosebumps on my arms. She wasn't moving. She didn't look like she was lost. She was just standing there looking at nothing, I guess. There was just a wall there. We made eye contact as I walked past her. And I swear I felt heat leaving my body. That's the best way I can explain it. I heard behind me the sound of shuffling. And I looked back to see her moving really slowly to follow me in the direction I went. I said to myself I'd ask her if she was okay after I dropped off the paperwork to the office, which was right around the corner from the hallway I saw her in. Here's the thing. I came back out of the office 30 seconds after I saw that woman, and she was nowhere to be found. There was nowhere she could have gone in that short amount of time, 
especially considering how slowly I saw her walking. She would have only made it a few meters in the time it took me to go into the office and come back out. I saw a nurse in that corridor on my way back, and I asked her if she saw the woman. She said no, and she hadn't seen anyone matching her description. The corridor didn't feel cold anymore as I made my way back, and I haven't seen that woman in the hours since. My co-workers think I just imagined her, but the goosebumps and the cold sinking feeling when we made eye contact were real. I think a hospital of all places would be where you'd see a ghost. I've been working here for a year, but this was the first experience I had that made me think, shit, was that really a ghost? I have no explanation for this. There was nowhere that woman could have gone where I wouldn't have seen her, especially at the speed she was going. This happened hours ago, but I'm still spooked. So I lived in a 40s concrete duplex, and ever since moving in a year ago, things always feel a little tense once the sun goes down, and every now and then, things are moved around whenever you leave a room and come back, and occasionally whenever I'm up late working on my computer, I'll see white figures out of the corner of my eyes, always in the same spot in the room. And once, I had a sleep paralysis encounter, where I saw it clearly, as it zoomed across the room at me. But I think I fucked up just now. So my bedroom door faces into a small hallway, and I've always made sure that when coming into my room, I always face my bed, and never look away until the door is closed behind me. I don't know why I started doing this, or even remember when it started, but it's just like an instinct. But a few minutes ago, around 11.40 p.m., I got hungry, so I went to the kitchen to grab something, but when I came back to my room, I don't know why I did it, but as I closed the door, I took a glance behind me into the hallway, and I saw something I can only compare to like a mix of SCP-1471 and No Face from Spirited Away, like this white mask-like face, a little taller than me, and I don't think I saw a body. Now I'm typing this on my computer, and I just feel like a kid getting called to the principal's office, and I keep looking away to the spot in my room the white thing likes to be, because it feels like someone is standing next to me, and I keep seeing a swishing white blur, kinda like someone waving a sheet out of the corner of my eye. Also, as I typed that last sentence, I had to freeze in place, because I swear, it felt like someone put their hand on my shoulder for a couple of seconds. I don't know what to do. Please, I hope someone sees this soon. This isn't my story, but my mom's. Her friend called her and was slightly hysterical that her house was haunted. My mom is a scientist and was very skeptical but agreed to come check it out. The friend was adamant that either the house was haunted or she was going crazy, and in either case, she needed help. My mom arrives at the friend's house and she begins showing my mom what she's seen. First, in the living room, there is a brass lamp that is shiny so you can see the reflection of the kitchen behind as you look at the lamp. She asks my mom to just watch the reflection in the lamp. My mother sees a shadowy man step out from behind the wall. She turns around. There's no one there. This phenomenon repeats itself several times. Next, they go into the friend's son's room. They turn off the lights, close the door, but they leave the hallway light on. As she's looking at the strip of light under the door, very clearly she sees the shadow of two feet step in front of the door. They open the door, and there's no one there. Again, this phenomenon repeats itself several times. Lastly, 
They go lay in the friend's bed. She fluffs up the comforter, and it falls on top of their legs. Very clearly, you can see the indentation of someone sitting on top of the comforter. They fluff up the comforter again, and it happens once more. All of these events would repeat themselves whenever she looked at them. My mom insists that she really tried to investigate all of these events, but she couldn't find any other explanation. The friend went to a medium or psychic soon after, who told her it was her furniture that was haunted, not the house. The furniture was secondhand, purchased at a garage sale. She got rid of the furniture, and all that paranormal stuff stopped. My husband and I were on an emergency trip out to Mississippi to help get my mom into a nursing home. I don't have a license to drive a car, so he had to drive the whole way. About 3 a.m., we get to this stretch of road that is, as far as I could tell, a stretch of road with inlaid fields on both sides. All well and good, but in the pitch black, with no street lights, at 3 a.m., it was really unnerving. I noticed my husband is not acting quite right, kind of like he was breathing differently, and his posture was a bit different. Little stuff, but you notice when you're married. I asked, honey, do you need to take a break? And he says, oh no, I'm fine. Let's just finish this strip and we can find a hotel. I trusted his judgment, and we made it across and hit the hay at a day's inn somewhere. The next morning, we wake up and are brushing our teeth, and I comment on how creepy that stretch of road was. He gets quiet and says, I honestly thought I dreamt that. I remember it not feeling real, and me feeling like it was a dream. I told him I'd asked him if he needed a break, and he said, Yeah, I remember that too, and I thought I dreamt it. Do me a favor, and I'll return it if the need arises. If I ever tell you I'm fine, and don't need a break after driving four hours in pitch darkness again. Don't take no for an answer. I was so out of it, I didn't realize I was that gone. So we now have a standing agreement to stop each other well before then. But the idea that he was fully disassociated in that moment and had less than a healthy grasp on reality always makes me shiver. I hate to imagine all the moments that could have gone wrong. Remember, exhausted driving is just as bad as drunk driving. This occurred in 2017 and is 100% true. Due to a multitude of factors, including a recent death of a close friend, I was unbearably depressed at this time in my life. For that reason, my family flew across the country to visit me in LA, where I live. We thought it would be nice to visit Catalina Island. When we arrived, it became apparent to us that it was the off-season. It was late November, the weather was cold, and as a result, the island was nearly empty besides locals and a few straggling tourists such as ourselves. Our first priority was to ditch our luggage so we could explore the island. So we immediately checked into our motel, though that word hardly does the place justice. I call it a motel because all the doors to the rooms exited to the outside, but in actuality, our room was one of 20 to 30 quaint guesthouse looking buildings arranged in a sort of horseshoe shape around a walkway with rooms on either side of the path. The entrance to the motel was essentially one of the points of the horseshoe, and if you walked dead straight, you'd reach the room we were given, essentially on the corner before you have to go right to go further into the horseshoe. So, from our room, one path led back to the street, the other further into the secluded maze of rooms. Stay with me. After a day of exploring and having just finished dinner, it was time for the cold, dark walk back to the room. Catalina Island is a decent distance from the mainland, and let me just say, 
It gets dark. Similarly dark was my headspace after the dinner conversation took a left-hand turn, and my overwhelming depression got the best of me. I pulled my black hoodie tighter over my freezing ears and walked ahead of my parents to the hotel room, telling them I just needed to go to sleep. And I did, immediately. Depression sometimes makes that easy. I was already losing consciousness as they entered after me, drifting off without so much as a good night. I then woke up to my mom saying my name, a harsh whisper. The room had two beds, my parents' bed closer to the door, and mine further in the room. My mom's voice cut through the silence again. She sounded concerned for me. I didn't blame her, considering my mental state at the time. Rocky, I rolled over. What? I asked. My eyes adjusted to the dim moonlight coming in through the curtains. I saw her turn to face me. She was surprised to see me in my bed. Her eyes got wide. If I'm in my bed, who was she talking to? We both looked back to where she was previously looking, to see a hooded figure in all black, standing over their bed. I know this is Let's Not Meet, and you're listening to this, knowing a creepy thing is going to happen, but understand how horrifically startling it is to be on the island in the middle of the ocean, and wake up to see a hooded stranger looming over you. This moment seemed to last forever. Life isn't like the movies, where characters unleash a blood-curdling scream. Sometimes the only thing that comes out is something panicked and guttural. My mom's words became low and severe as she said my dad's name in a dire voice that I've never heard her use before. Then the hooded figure did something so bizarre and unsettling. It didn't advance towards us, but instead crouched in the corner near where it stood. The way it crouched was so absolutely unexpected, even in regards to this already unexpected situation, that it terrified me. It seemed animalistic. I knew two things. The hooded figure had been standing over us while we were sleeping, and it's not acting in any sort of way that I can understand as opposed to the infinite moment of this figure standing over us mere seconds ago. The series of events that unfolded when my hulking ex-military dad woke up happened in an instant. Suddenly, we were out the door, not knowing which way the intruder went. My mom was screaming, Get him! Get him! My dad was running down the path of the horseshoe, further into the hotel, shouting through sheer adrenaline, I'm gonna fucking kill you. I ran down the path towards the street. When I got there, not a sign of the intruder, but it became suspiciously quiet behind me. I ran back to the room to find my dad quietly walking back, his head low. He gets really close to me and I hear him say, it's a fucking kid. The explanation, some young teen, Tall and lanky as I'm in my twenties, wearing all black, including a black hoodie, went into the wrong room. Or room. The one time my parents just so happened to forget to lock the door. My mom woke up when he entered, and seeing a tall person in a black hoodie, thought he was me, assumedly leaving the room in a depressive episode. And when the hooded figure crouched, that was him realizing his mistake and panicking. He was scared of us. As I got back to the room, my mom walked out and hugs this kid, who is now crying his eyes out. I would be too if a massive ex-soldier was sprinting after me with murder in his eyes. So, to the now traumatized kid from Catalina Island, I look forward to reading your let's not meet of this same event, but from your perspective.
my 10-year-old daughter sleep talks. Sometimes she'll even sit up and look around. Last night, she dozed off on the couch, and 15 minutes later, she sat up and said, Where did it go? It's okay, honey. Go back to bed, I replied. She laid down and asked me again where it went. Go back to sleep, I said. Then I immediately heard a man's voice right in front of me say, No. I looked at my daughter and she was asleep again. My husband was in another part of the house in our bedroom asleep. I'm still shaken. There was a man who passed away in our living room in 2017. There was also a man who shot his wife in the head with a shotgun in 1986 in the driveway across the street. We also live by a cemetery. I mean right next door. I've never felt spooked until last night. I haven't slept. The voice was so aggressive. I hate this so much. It was so close and so real. I don't know how else to explain it. For an update, I just asked my daughter if she ever has dreams about ghosts or sees ghosts. She said no. I asked if she thought the house was haunted. She replied, Well, there are the dimes. I forgot all about the dimes. They fall on her. She has so many dimes. We rarely use cash, and she has a reloadable cash card, so we have no idea where they come from. She'll be in the kitchen, and I'll hear a coin hit the floor. She'll say, Thanks, Jeff, and put it in her bank in her room. I forgot all about that. I didn't tell her what happened last night. I think it will terrify her. We have three boxer dogs that hurt it too. When I told my husband about what happened, he asked me if that's why the dogs woke him up, scratching at the bedroom door, trying to get out. They usually all pile in bed with us. I heard them scratching at the door, but not until later. I'd gotten up after my heart calmed down and decided to go pee once more before cashing in for the night. The dogs never do this. They go to bed when he goes to bed. For another update, just now my daughter said to me, Do you think people can talk to ghosts? Do consider that we went to see the new Beetlejuice movie after school yesterday, so that could be related. I said to her, Anything is possible. My grandpa always said, If someone said they saw this or that, Never dismiss it, because you never know. My daughter replied, Isn't he the grandpa that worked in the Air Force at Roswell's, the alien place? I said, Roswell, and yes. She asked, Did he believe in aliens and ghosts? Oh yeah. He had an author he loved that talked about supernatural encounters. I can't remember his name. But my grandma would say he was crazy when he'd bring this sort of thing up, I replied. Well, she wasn't lucky enough to see that sort of stuff, my daughter said. Why do you ask? I inquired. Oh, I was just curious, she replied. This isn't my story, but instead my sister, who will be using my account to share it with all of you. When I was in high school, I was good friends with a girl called Emma. Emma was kind of quiet and shy, but was always there if you needed her. When I finished high school, I lost touch with Emma, as what happens to a lot of friendships after school. Two years later in college, I started dating a guy called Ben and Ben's best friend Gary was Emma's boyfriend. After discovering we all knew each other, we started to hang out again. One of the nights, we planned to all hang out in Gary's house, have a few drinks, and play a few games. Myself and Ben showed up at about 8pm to Gary's house, and Gary said Emma should be over soon. That was fine. We opened our beers and started drinking. It was nearly 9pm, and Emma still wasn't here so we decided to ring her. Emma answered and apologized for being late. She said she was just finished getting ready, and she should be there soon. At 9.30 p.m., there was still no sign of Emma, so we called again. This time, 
Her younger brother picked up the phone. Her brother was 15 years old at the time, and he had told us Emma was not feeling well and that she was in the bathroom. Gary was worried, and he asked if he could head over and check on her. But her brother was adamant that he was looking after Emma, and she was all right, and said to enjoy our night. We didn't go home. Instead, we kept drinking and hanging out, because all we thought was Emma just had the simple flu. Just after 10 p.m., we decided to call one last time and check on Emma. Again, her brother answered and calmly told us that Emma had gone to bed, that she will call us in the morning. We left it at that, believing she was safe at home in bed, and we didn't want to annoy her brother by non-stop calling. That night, Emma's mother returned home at 12 to find Emma dead on the kitchen floor. Emma had been bludgeoned to death by her younger brother a couple of hours earlier. We later found out when Emma was leaving to come to us, her and her brother got into a fight about something ridiculous and he beat her with a baseball bat. He then proceeded to stab her over 51 times. Since her brother was a minor, he was not going to be sent to prison. Instead, her brother pleaded insanity and he was sent to an institution. A lot of this information was not leaked as the accuser was a minor. I do know that his parents stuck by him and he was released after four years. I used to work in a grocery store from 2015 to 2017. It's not so much as scary, but really unsettling. And this was at an old grocery store I used to work at. There would be several nights where I would see shadows or apparitions out of the corner of my eye, whether I was sweeping the aisle floors or cleaning the store's meat department. I would even see silhouettes of really strange shit in the meat department. Stuff would get knocked off the shelves despite not being capable of it, like a box of rice that's pushed back to where even if it did fall over, it would still have plenty of shelf space to catch it. I had constant feelings of being watched, or I heard voices when there was no one there, especially if I worked a solo night, and former co-workers who also worked there alone heard the same things. They would even swear they would hear it despite not being there. Footsteps being heard coming up the stairs, coming up to the employee break room, even if all of us were there, or if it was a solo night for any of us. Equipment would be moved or shifted around slightly. I once witnessed a mop handle stand up on its own for like three seconds, and then it readjusted itself, despite there being nothing there capable of doing it. We would often see people inside windows looking at us, and there would be no one out at that time of night. The guy I used to work with asked me if I was playing a joke on him when I was cleaning off the bandsaw in the meat department. I told him no, I was cleaning the machine while I had my headphones on, and he told me he heard footsteps walking behind him on the floor while he was mopping near the cash registers, and he felt like someone was watching him. And the next night was rife with activity. We even found a footprint that didn't match our shoes at all and there was no evidence of anyone else there or breaking in. It was in a part where there was mop water from cleaning a caked-in spill because we were constantly being left without any cleaning. If only Jolene hadn't worn that stupid mask, things might have ended differently. I might have called off the whole trip and saved everyone. It all started as I stood at my mailbox waiting like a little kid who had ordered a toy from a cereal box. The mailman usually came at 3 o'clock, never fail unless something had happened. I stood at my mailbox staring at my watch that said 310. So what was the holdup? Did he have a flat tire? Did a terrorist attack? Did a bear grab him when he was trying to deliver me my precious delivery? Just as I was about to turn and go back to the house, 
I saw the little yellow light flashing on top of a car coming my way and nearly jumped out of my skin. This was it. If it didn't come today, there was no way I'd have time to order another one before leaving for the camping trip. The car slowly pulled up to the mailbox and I said hello. Instead of putting the mail in the box, he handed me a few letters and looked away. My heart sank as he turned and faced the road. Isn't there anything else for me? I said, trying to keep the desperation out of my voice. He turned and looked in the back seat. Oh, wait, it looks like there's something I forgot, he said, reaching into the back and handing me a brown envelope with the address on it I'd been looking for. He smiled and waved as he drove off, leaving me holding my prize. This was going to be a good camping trip now. I nearly skipped back to the house, threw the other mail on the table without looking at it, before ripping open the package. There it was, my glorious book light. I'm an avid reader and an avid camper. It's always been a struggle to read during camping trips. I took along various battery-powered lamps and flashlights, but nothing seemed to work for me. Getting comfortable enough to really settle into my book was a challenge. When I saw this light advertised on Instagram, I instantly knew this was what I needed. It was a book light that wrapped around your neck with a light at each end that would shine on the book. There was no doubt it would be perfect, and I ordered one right away. Finally, I could finish packing for the camping trip. My friends and I loved to go hiking and camping. With the huge state park so close, it was a no-brainer that we would be there as often as possible. Every time we decided to go, we would all meet up at the trailhead and hike to the site together. This time would be the exception. There were scheduling conflicts, and if we wanted to go at all, it wouldn't be at the same time. Don and Rose could barely get away for the weekend. They would have to catch up to us later at the campsite. At the last minute, even Jolene called and said she was running behind and might not make it until later. In retrospect, I should have seen it coming, seeing what the date we had set for our trip. But instead of canceling and choosing another time, I just shrugged it off as conflicting schedules and hefted my backpack, then started down the trail. Being by myself on this trail never really bothered me before. I hiked this trail many times and never had a problem. I decided to go early and get the camp set up so we could have maximum time together. My schedule had been cleared for the entire trip and I was going to take full advantage. The sun had set until I started down the trail and it would be dark by the time I got to our campsite. Hiking at night wasn't the best thing to do, even though I knew the trail. But aside from getting camp set up, I was also excited to use my new book light. It worked surprisingly well, lighting up the trail and made it much easier to use my walking stick for the most difficult parts of the trail, taking it slow, going at my own pace, and enjoying as much scenery as I could was a luxury I was enjoying. Usually Dawn would lead the group and drive us hard until we got to camp. I wanted to get out my book and read as I walked, but I figured that would be tempting fate and I had no desire to faceplant on the trail after discovering a tree root the hard way. As I walked, lost in thought, suddenly the forest became eerily silent. The birds stopped singing, squirrels stopped chattering, even crickets stopped chirping. It was so quiet, I could hear my own footsteps. It was very unsettling. I stopped and slowly turned around, using my light to search for anything unusual. After a full circle without seeing anything out of the ordinary, I tried to shake off the feeling and just keep going. It didn't take long for me to begin speeding up. Every step was somehow more desperate than the last, as if getting to my campsite would somehow protect me from whatever was out there making the animals and creatures of the night afraid to make a sound. By the time I could see the clearing where we camped rising in the distance, I was power walking, nearly running. All of a sudden, the noises started back up again. 
as if someone had flipped a switch, or I had somehow stepped out of some invisible danger zone. I paused and turned back to see if there was any physical sign of what had happened, if there was some creature lurking behind me or something, but there was nothing, and nothing seemed to be even more unnerving. It wasn't until later, after everything was over, that I realized how stupid it was for me to travel this trail by myself, let alone in the dark. I guess it was a combination of things that made me do it. First of all, just the disappointment of everyone nearly cancelling at the last minute. Secondly, was my surprise package that came on time, and just wanting to use this cool new light in any way I could. But the really big thing that did it for me was my stubbornness. I had decided I was going camping come hell or high water. I didn't realize it would be the former. It didn't even register that I was heading out alone on the trail at night on October 30th, the day before Halloween. It didn't take me long to get my tent set up, and I didn't bother with the fire. I just dove straight inside and zipped up the entrance, somehow believing that the thin layer of tent material would keep me safe from anything that went bump in the night. I lay there on the bare tent floor, breathing hard in sheer terror, wondering why I was so frightened. There hadn't been any tangible proof of anything following me. I had seen nothing. What had gotten me so worked up? This is what I told myself over and over, until my breathing slowed back to normal as I unpacked my backpack to settle in. Once I was secure in my sleeping bag, I finally dug out the book I brought along for the trip. It was a domestic thriller called Secrets, about a woman whose life was turned upside down. I turned on my light and began reading. It didn't take me long to become so engrossed in the story that the world around me disappeared. That was when the adrenaline crash from the fear grabbed my face and said, You're going to sleep now. Sometime later, I woke and pulled my face out of the small puddle of drool that had soaked into my sleeping bag. I sat up, wiped my mouth, and stretched. To my great surprise, the book light was still on, and I hadn't broken it by laying on it. The darkness outside had given way to a dull gray. It must have been just before sunrise. Pulling myself out of the sleeping bag gave me an instant reminder of how cold autumn mornings can be in the forest. While pulling on my jacket, I froze. There was something or someone moving around just outside my tent. Zipping up my jacket quietly, I slid towards the zipper tent window in hopes of getting a closer look. My hands shook as I pulled the tap slowly, hoping to make as little noise as possible and sneak a peek at whatever was out there. My eyes slid up to the opening and peered out. All I could see through the slit was dim outlines of trees through the growing morning light. I scanned around as much as I could through my limited view when suddenly a pair of glowing eyes appeared in the window. I screamed and threw myself backward onto my sleeping bag, landing with a thump that took my breath away. The shadow of the creature moved from the window to the main tent flap. I lay there helpless as the zipper undid itself, and the hideous face of the monster poked itself inside. It roared so loud, I clamped my hands over my ears. My life flashed before my eyes, as it slowly entered the tent, growling and snarling. Regret filled me. Why didn't I wait for my friends? But then they would die with me. Maybe it was better they were late. They would find my horribly mutilated and possibly eaten body. But they might survive if they ran away. As these thoughts chased each other around my brain, I noticed something. The creature was wearing a sparkly bracelet. Not only that, but it seemed to have a manicure. Now that I looked more closely, it was wearing a t-shirt and sweatpants. I reached up and grabbed the creature's face, 
and ripped it off with all my might. Ouch, it said as the fur came loose. In a heartbeat, I was holding the creature's face in my hand, and Jolene stood there rubbing her eyes. You think you could yank my ears off the next time, she said. Sure, after I'm done having a heart attack, you jerk, I said. She smiled, still rubbing her eyes. Happy Halloween, she said. Screw you, I said, throwing the mask at her and storming out of the tent. Wait, you're not really mad, are you? I heard her say from behind me as I tromped down the trail. I didn't bother to turn around or even slow down. Where are you going? She asked. The thought registered in my head, but I couldn't seem to answer the question. Where was I going? I was just stomping down the trail with no destination in mind. The sun was peeking over the horizon as I passed a clearing in the trees. Without thinking, I slowed to a stop and stood there, admiring the simple, elegant beauty of the sunrise. I heard and felt a presence beside me as I stared into the rising sun. Beautiful, isn't it? Jolene said. I turned to her and smiled. I should throw you off this cliff, I said. She took a step back, her eyes filled with uncertainty. Sucks being afraid, doesn't it? I said. Yeah, she said, staying a healthy distance away from me. I guess it does. You know what you should do with that mask, I said. I'm sure you have a few creative suggestions, she said carefully. I turned to her with a gleam in my eyes. You should scare the hell out of Dawn and Rose. Her look slowly transformed from fear to confusion as the edge of her lip slid up into a grin. It was late afternoon when Dawn and Rose came huffing and puffing up the hill to the campsite. I'd started a campfire and made some lunch. There was also some coffee brewing on the fire. Well, you two sure took your time, I said, poking at the fire and adding another piece of wood. You're lucky we came at all, Don said. I was going to call and cancel. Like Jolene did, I said, trying my best to sound upset and disappointed. Are you kidding me? Rose said, dropping her backpack, after we busted our butts to get up here. Afraid so, I said. That's great. Dawn said, pulling her cell phone out of her pocket. You wait until I talk to her. I wasn't sure if Jolene had silenced her phone or not. Dawn's call could ruin the whole prank. My mind searched frantically for something to do. Don't bother, I said. I already tried calling her this morning. It went straight to voicemail. Hmm, Dawn said, putting her phone back in her pocket. She's probably snuggled up in bed, sleeping. Well, at least you two made it, I said, pointing to the logs around the fire. Take a load off. They looked at the log with disdain, but shrugged and sat. I guess exhaustion will lower your standards regarding where you rest. We chit-chatted for a while, mostly about how upset we were with Jolene for skipping out on us. Then I helped them set up their tents. We had just finished, when off in the distance, we heard a roar and a scream. What was that? Don said, looking around, trying to determine what direction it had come from. I don't know, I said, putting on an Oscar-level performance of looking frightened while trying not to smile. Jolene had outdone herself. She said she would look around for roaring sounds on her phone, but that was so loud. I didn't know her phone could get that loud. Light was just beginning to fade, making it even harder to see if there was anything coming out of the trees towards us. Rose was having a full panic attack. What do we do? What do we do? She asked. Let's just go in our tents and hope whatever it is doesn't care about finding us. I replied. We should leave, Rose said, her eyes darting all around, searching for danger. I think so too, 
Don said. If there's something out there, it could come after us. I tried to do a quick pivot to save the prank. Where would we go? I said. Our cars are miles away. If that thing was after us, it would stalk us on the trail too, and we wouldn't have our tents made up to hide in. They looked at me with what looked like suspicion that turned into resignation. I guess you're right, Don said. We should just go in our tents and hope that thing goes away. Are you kidding me? Rose said. Why not just wrap ourselves in our sleeping bags and serve ourselves up as burritos for that thing? Don't you think you're overreacting? I said. We don't even know what that was. Maybe it was some animal calling for a mate. And what about the scream? It could have been someone that saw it and was scared, I said. Don watched our back and forth conversation. Let's just go to our tents, she said. No, Rose said. I want to leave right now. There's the trail, I said, pointing. No one's stopping you. She looked from the trail to Don to me. I turned and went into my tent. A few minutes later, I heard another tent flap rustle, followed by a third. A smile crept across my face. This was going to be fun. I was so excited, I barely read any of my book. Within an hour, I heard something outside the tent, rustling through the campsite and knocking things over. Here we go, I whispered. It was all I could do to stay in my tent when I heard Rose scream. There was no way I could watch Jolene chasing them around with that ridiculous mask on and not howl with laughter. I wanted to give the prank time for them to be scared before revealing our devious plan. Fits of laughter fought to escape me, but I held them in as I heard Don's screams join the fray. From the sound, they were all running around, destroying the campsite. Between the growls, running, knocking into things and screams of terror, the whole cacophony of it was nearly impossible to sit through. Every inch of me was aching to jump out and yell, Happy Halloween, we got you. After a few minutes, the noise died down. Everyone must have gotten tired. I was still waiting for the aha moment when I heard Don or Rose curse at Jolene. The mask wasn't that convincing once you calmed down and got a bit of a closer look at it. Any minute now, I leaned close to the wall of my tent, but all movement had stopped. It was like everyone had just laid down and took a nap. I couldn't take it any longer. I ripped open my tent and jumped out, yelling, Surprise! Happy Hollow! The rest of the world died on my tongue. The campsite wasn't in disarray. It was destroyed. Both Don and Rose's tents were flattened. As I stepped closer, I saw rips and gouges in their tents as well. As I looked around the campsite at the carnage, my first thought was, Wow, Jolene really overdid it. But that thought didn't hold for long. The more I moved through the camp, the more I saw claw marks and huge footprints, something that Jolene couldn't do. All doubts ended when I came across Dawn. She lay in a pool of blood, and at first I thought it was a trick, that they had turned Jolene back against me, and now I was being pranked. However, that thought died a quick death. When I saw Dawn's severed arm, laying a few feet from her. Her eyes were wide open in shock. She looked at me with a blank stare of accusation and tried to whisper something, but I couldn't hear it. I leaned closer and she whispered again, her final words haunting me. This couldn't be Jolene. It wasn't a trick or a prank. Something real had just invaded our camp and destroyed my friend. Fear gripped me as I looked around to see if this creature was lying in wait to kill me too. As I searched the rest of the camp, hoping moment by moment that this thing was gone, I also didn't find Rose. Eventually, I found a large pool of blood not far from her tent. 
but nobody was around. The trail of blood led from the pool off towards the woods, and I had no desire to follow it. The next thought that came to my panicked mind was, if this wasn't Jolene, then where was she? She purposely didn't tell me where she was hiding, so I wouldn't unintentionally give away her position by glancing at a certain spot. It was a smart plan, until she went missing, and I have no idea what's going on. My next thought was calling for help, but when I got out my phone, I found it was also dead. Even though I didn't want to, I went over to Dawn's now dead body and searched for her cell phone, but I found it in pieces. There would be no call for help. Despondency smothered me and pulled me to the ground. I sat in the middle of the campsite beside a pool of blood that used to be one of my friends, only a handful of feet away from the broken body that used to be another one of my friends, having no idea where my third friend was. I'd never been in such a desperate place in my life, not only physically, but mentally, and I hoped I would never be in such a place again. I had no idea what to do or where to go. The realization began to set in that I had lost three of my closest friends in the space of a day. Tears flowed down my cheeks as I sat there in the glowing darkness with only the embers of the dying light to keep me company. Should I sit here and hope that help would stumble by in the form of another hiker, or even better, a park ranger? It was late October, and the trails weren't very well traveled once the weather turned cold. As I sat there, a gust of wind blew through, tearing at the few remaining leaves clinging to their branches. They began to fall as if the forest was crying with me or for me. I wish I knew what the forest knew about this thing that had destroyed my friends and my life, about how I would get out of here alive, and most of all, about what had happened to Jolene. As much as I wanted to just sit there and mourn forever, I knew I couldn't. I knew I had to get up and go figure this out. How would I get out of here? How would I survive? Maybe my tent held the key. By some miracle, my tent was undamaged. I started digging through my backpack. There are always things in everyone's backpack that they have for emergencies that never happen. Usually, it's a snake bite kit, a length of rope, or band-aids that seldom, if ever, get used. But as I was digging, I came across some things that might be useful. There was a can of pepper spray and a small pocket knife. At this point, I was happy to have anything I could use as a weapon. They went in my pocket, along with the rope. So now, it was decision time. Do I pack up my stuff right now and leave? Hiking down the trail in the dark, having no idea if this thing is still on the hunt. Or do I lay down and get some rest, wait for morning, and hope it doesn't know I'm here? Neither one was a great option. There was no way I could even consider burying Dawn. I didn't have a shovel, and I would need all my energy to hike back out of here if I hoped to survive. Thankfully, the decision was made for me. As I laid there, mind whirling from everything that had happened, I fell asleep. I woke hours later to a bright morning sun peeking through my open tent window. I yawned and stretched, thinking about what a beautiful morning it could be, when suddenly I remembered everything that had happened. That's when I heard the growling. It was just loud enough to get my attention. Fear gripped me as I tried to figure out what to do. My brain went into full useless mode as, run out of the tent screaming, rose to the top of possible options. The growling didn't seem to get any closer as I lay there awaiting my fate. Encouraged by the fact that I hadn't become the monster's breakfast yet, I got up to my knees and quietly looked out the window. What I saw disgusted and enraged me. 
There were two mountain lions having their breakfast. Normally, I wouldn't care about such a thing more than staying as far away as possible. But today, their breakfast was my friend's dead body. I did exactly what was at the top of my brain's list. Ran out of the tent, screaming. At first, I ran straight at them, hoping it would scare them off. They both just stopped and stared at me, as if I were some rude interloper interrupting them having morning tea. The next thing they did was turn and take a few steps towards me. As I stared at their blood-soaked faces, I realized I had done the worst thing possible. I lowered my hands and started backing away, trying to look as non-threatening as possible. This seemed to encourage them to increase their pursuit. I was almost back to my tent, but it didn't seem like diving inside and hiding was an option now. They were aware of me and very interested in me, possibly as lunch. As my list of potential actions dwindled to wait for death, my hand brushed against my leg and I felt something in my pocket. It was the pepper spray. I pulled it out, having no idea if it even worked on cats, and aimed it at them. They didn't slow in the slightest. It looked like a stream of water sprayed out of the can and landed on the first cat's face. Its reaction was immediate. It let out a massive yowl and began clawing at its face. The second paused in confusion, watching its companion devolve into convulsions of pain. When it looked back at me, I had already sprayed its face, causing the same reaction. For a long moment, I was treated to the insanely comical sight of these two predators twirling in circles, trying to claw their own faces off. And then the impossible happened. They both decided breakfast wasn't worth the cost of admission and ran off. I looked down at this small, innocuous-looking spray can that had just saved my life. It was tempting to give it a kiss in celebration, but I didn't want to take any chance of getting any spray on me. Writhing in pain wasn't high on my list of things to do today. Having just escaped death, I decided on my plan of action. My backpack was packed in under a half hour, and I was on the trail. Having said my goodbyes to Dawn and what was left of Rose, a sharp pang of guilt stabbed me as I left the campsite. Dawn's last whispered words haunted me. Shouldn't have come. She was right, of course. If any of us had known what was about to happen, there was no way we should have been here. But that's the whole point of life, I guess. None of us know what's going to happen at any minute. As if I wasn't depressed enough as it was, that thought sent me into near panic as my eyes darted all around, searching for danger. Now it wasn't only the monster, but the mountain lions and any other creature whose home I had invaded. Right then, I knew I would never visit this place again. Even the woodland creatures were quiet out of respect for my fallen friends. Wait, how would they know? As if in answer, the monster stepped out onto the trail and stared down at me. It was massive. I'd never seen anything that tall. Not only was it tall, but its shoulders were a good five feet wide. It was covered in dark fur that had splotches of wet, dark stains down the front of it. My mind told me that was all that was left of Rose. It unleashed a deafening roar that made a small river flow down my pant leg. My mind was like a little dog chasing its tail, trying to figure out what to do. As I stood there, frozen to the spot, it took two steps and was right in front of me. When it reached for me, some basic survival mode kicked in, and I went to the last thing that had saved my life. I whipped out the pepper spray, and emptied the can in the monster's face. It reared back and screamed so loud, I had to hold my ears as I ran around it and sprinted down the trail. 
My heart was pumping adrenaline. My feet barely touched the ground. I'd never run so fast in my entire life. The trees were a blur as I wound back and forth along the trail. All I could think was, just get away, just get away. As hope soared that I might be able to do just that, I heard a noise coming from behind me. It was like a bulldozer with legs. I heard pounding and crashing, as if something was destroying whatever got in its way. I glanced back, and the monster was gaining on me. But it was flailing its arms around in front of me, as if to protect its eyes from whatever was there. That momentary distraction was just enough. My foot caught on a branch I wasn't looking for, and I went tumbling at full speed off the trail and into the brush. I hit a tree hard with my back. I was sure I heard a crack. It was all I could do to just stay conscious. I watched through bleary eyes as the monster ran past me on the trail. There was no way I could celebrate or even move. Running so fast for so long had taken its toll. And now having fallen and possibly injuring my back, had just added to my immobility. It took me a few long moments to catch my breath. Once I did, I slowly moved body parts to make sure they still worked. I saved the worst for last. Trying to sit up caused pain to shoot down my back. That wasn't a good sign. It seemed like I would be here for a little bit, at least until I recovered enough to make another try for my car. I knew it was less than a mile away, but right now, I couldn't even think about getting up to walk, let alone run. I painfully pulled my backpack off and sat it beside me. Next, I tried to cover myself and my pack with the loose leaves that blanketed the ground. Within ten minutes, I was satisfied that no one would be able to see me from the trail without looking very closely. There was a peephole I'd left open to keep an eye on the trail. The monster would be back eventually. There was no doubt about that. Once it realized I wasn't on the trail anymore, it would backtrack looking for me. Spraying it may have saved my life, but it also doomed me to be its enemy forever. It would search high and low to find me. I was as sure about that as anything. Even though it was mid-morning, the trees here were dense, and light had to filter through a lot of them to make it to the ground. Reaching into my pack, I pulled out my reading light, which was surprisingly still in one piece. I used it to check my wounds, and found they were mostly cuts and scrapes. As my adrenaline crashed, I could feel myself being once again dragged into unconsciousness. My eyes drooped, then suddenly shot open as I heard something. The part of the trail I could see through my peephole was quite small. I leaned to the left a bit, trying to not make any sound. That's when I heard sniffing and saw the monster coming slowly back up the trail. It was on all fours, smelling the ground. One eye looked like it was swollen shut, and the other was bloodshot. It got to the point in the trail where I'd fallen. It stopped, then turned and looked right at me. My blood turned to liquid nitrogen. The monster stalked straight towards me, as if it could see me plain as day. I glanced down and realized, to my horror, that my reading light was still on. I panicked. If I turned it off, the monster would know I was there. If I left it on, it was a beacon leading it right to me. I gently pulled it from around my neck, trying to move as little as possible. Once I had it off me, I set it on top of my backpack, so it was at the same level as it had been around my neck. I slid it away from the pack. I reached into my pocket and pulled out the knife, then opened it. The monster was so close, I could smell the stench of death coming from its mouth. It got right up to the light, and brushed the leaves away to see what this thing was. There was only one shot for me to survive. 
I swung the knife with all the strength I had left, stabbing it in the eye that wasn't swollen. It reared back and screamed in pain. I didn't wait around to see what was going to happen. Every ounce of energy I had went to running away from this homicidal monster. My back screamed at me, but I ignored it. The creature screamed again, this time in rage rather than pain. It tore off after me, but couldn't see me, so it ended up slamming into a tree three feet behind me. My legs kept pumping, driven by the sheer terror. As I glanced back, I saw the monster listening to me run away. It followed my sounds and ran after me again. I pivoted and ran up the side of the trail, just in time for it to miss me and fall face first on the trail. It wasn't far to the trailhead now. I knew it was getting close. There was a hard turn in the trail where I had to be careful of my footing. It was narrow and there was a steep drop that ended in a river far below. I ran to where the turn was and suddenly stopped. The monster had gotten up and was listening for me again. It was a gamble, but I stood at the turn and jogged in place as though I was still running away. It listened, then launched itself toward me. As soon as it began to run, I quietly stepped around the corner and softly walked down the trail a few feet. If my gamble paid off, I would be home free. If it didn't, I'd be dead. Time slowed as the beast galloped towards the turn. I watched and waited, until finally I saw the bloody fur of its face with the knife still sticking out. At that last moment, it seemed to sense me around the corner and tried to turn, but momentum had already carried it past me, and it had no chance of staying on the trail. I leaned over and watched as it fell helplessly over the edge and tumbled down to the water below, hitting its head on several trees as it went. It had just come to rest at the bottom when I took off running. The trailhead loomed in front of me, and I didn't want to take any chances of that thing recovering and catching me before I got to my car. I'd never seen a more beautiful sight than my beat-up Toyota Corolla. When I approached it, I paused yet again and looked around for who or what might be watching me. Hanging from my driver's side mirror was the mask Jolene had worn. I took it off the mirror and looked at it in shock and confusion. Inside was a note. There was a crash from the woods that told me the monster hadn't given up. I jumped in the car, threw the mask on the passenger seat, and broke every speeding law getting out of the park. Even once I was on the main road, I pushed the pedal down to make the car go as fast as it could. My speedometer needle was vibrating when I hit 80. It wasn't until I was close to home that I slowed down. I got out and went into my tiny house, bringing the mask. I collapsed on the couch as my back complained. I would have to schedule an appointment with my chiropractor. Once I was safely inside, I picked up the mask and pulled out the note. It read, I'm sorry to leave without telling you. The girls were coming up the trail and I was about to jump out at them when I saw this monster following them through the woods. I couldn't warn them or you without the monster seeing. When they set up their tents, it was watching from the edge of the woods. I panicked and quietly left while it was busy watching the camp. I hope you're alive to read this, and if so, you can someday forgive me. Signed, J. I lay the note beside me on the couch, and all I could think of as tears streamed down my cheeks were Dawn's final words to me. Shouldn't have come. I had planned a Halloween party for Saturday night. I've always loved October. 
It's a shame I don't drink or like pumpkin-flavored things. Recently, I've sworn to get more into the spirit of the season. I've got some of the best bad horror movies, decorations from the dollar store, and some of those pumpkin sugar cookies. I invited all my friends for a casual night to get into the Halloween spirit. No one showed up, which is understandable. We're all adults with busy lives and all. I could eat ten boxes of cookies without getting sick of them. I did feel a little hurt when I saw posts of a handful of friends dressed up at a bar. I said they could drink, but I wouldn't. I shook it off, telling myself I didn't care. I was just going to be the guy watching horror movies alone on the weekend before Halloween. I didn't do a totally lame thing like buy pumpkins to carve and a fleece frog onesie as a costume. I'm an adult like my friends who went to the bar to party. I may have been a little bit bitter. This small get-together was also meant to be some sort of housewarming. I finally got to the point in my life where I could afford rent and food. I got a small townhouse, loving I no longer had roommates neglecting their chores or clogging the toilet. The fact I could afford all this was a miracle. I wonder if my friends thought I was showing off a bit. I almost didn't feel like it, but I put on a movie after sunset. Watching a bad slasher wasn't the same without friends. I tossed on 13 Ghosts because I remembered that scared me the last time I watched it. Turns out, I was a big baby back then. Some of the short horror videos on YouTube were more frightening than any of the movies I picked out for the night. I considered going to bed early, calling the entire thing a bust. Then, someone showed up. I heard something out in the backyard. Animals often got through the gate to go through my trash. Just small things like raccoons or possums. I started to put my food scraps out for them in a dish so they wouldn't rip apart my trash. I know I shouldn't feed wild animals. They're going to get the food either way. It just saves me from cleaning up a torn bag in the morning. I liked taking photos of the nighttime visitors. They normally showed up later in the evening, causing me to wonder just what was in the yard. The glare of the light on the glass door kept me from seeing much. I opened the door a crack to peek outside. The sounds I assumed to be an animal got louder. I strained to hear. It was as if someone was whispering. Was it the neighbors in their yard? I didn't see a soul outside. The mental image of someone peeking over the fence made the back of my neck prickle. Something fell off the counter in the kitchen. I'm man enough to admit I screamed like a girl. My heart thudded hard against my chest. I thought someone had broken in and not that a box of cereal had fallen off the counter. I turned my back to the open door to look across the room to see what had fallen. My first floor was just an open space. I could see the kitchen area from where I stood by the back door. I confirmed it was just a box falling over. I then closed the door. Oddly enough, the whispering stopped. No more scary movies for me that night. Okay, one more. But Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island is a Halloween classic, and not a movie that would add to my unnerved mental state. I'm also man enough to admit, I kept all the lights on that night. I didn't care about an increased electric bill. I wouldn't like a shadow person to get me while I walked up the stairs in the dark, thank you very much. This is a normal and reasonable precaution. As I watched a childhood classic, I couldn't shake the feeling I was being watched. I needed a snack, something to take my mind off of things. I wisely invested in a chest freezer. It was cheaper to buy things in bulk and freeze things later after all. It wasn't smart keeping your chest freezer in the unfinished part of your basement for when you wanted ice cream. I stood at the top of the stairs, my mind playing tricks on me. I flipped on the light before I even looked down into the basement, fearing seeing the darkness staring back at me. I hadn't put much down there. The side of the basement from the top of the stairs really looked like an abyss with the lights off. 
an intrusive thought came to mind that if I turned the light off to stare down, something would stare back up at me. I scoffed at such a dumb idea. To prove myself wrong, I flicked off the light. Surely, I was alone. No one else here, not at all. A set of red eyes pierced through the abyss, landing on my own. Nope, nope, nope. I flicked the light back on, my heart racing. I mentally cursed myself, hating the fact one horror movie got me seeing things. To again prove myself wrong, I turned the light off. Do you know those movies that kill off a character at the start to set the tone? I would have been one of those characters. Even the eyes in the dark seemed disappointed in my stupidity. I was moving the moment they were. I heard a cackling laughter and heavy footsteps racing up the stairs. The front door was so close by. I felt something tear through the back of my costume. I didn't have time to get outside. The two seconds unlocking the door meant my death. Instead, I ducked inside the small bathroom right beside my freedom. I slammed the door on a set of long, dark fingers. I screamed, trying to get the door fully closed. By sheer luck, the intruder pulled their fingers away so I could lock the door. Whatever was on the other side banged against the wood, laughing in a raspy voice that made my skin crawl. The doorknob wiggled. I tightened my hands around it, praying it would hold. Finally, the noise died down. The thing was still out there. I was trapped. No cell phone, no food, not even a window to crawl through. I knew whatever monster I now faced could break down the door. It was just playing with me. Why don't you end this quickly? You don't want to starve to death in there, do you? The thing whispered on the other side of the door. I would die of thirst first, I corrected. Wait, there was a sink in here. I would starve to death. No wonder that monster cornered me so easily. I studied my ripped frog suit. Could it be fixed? This thing cost a lot of money after all. Why are you even here? No one ever said the place was haunted, I asked. I hoped that the longer I spoke with the monster, the less frightening it would become. Exposure therapy and all that. Oh, I think you're well aware of your past sins. This kind of pain was coming to you one way or another. The doorknob wiggled making a chill go down my back. Nope. This thing would be scary no matter how long I heard it speak. But what sense is it talking about? I scanned my brain desperately trying to think of anything it was referring to. Sure, I did give a co-worker a bit of a mean nickname, but never to his face. And it was only after he was a dick to me for an entire year and after he made such a huge mess, we needed to stay for overtime for a week to clean it up. I also only tipped the DoorDash driver $9 in my last order instead of 13 What else? If you admit to what you've done, I'll be gentle when I eat your heart out while you're still alive. The voice whispered. Uh, I don't think that's possible, but thank you for the offer, I said, voice shaking a little. A small sound came from behind the door. It was a mixture of a snort and an annoyed hiss. What else have I done? Said I was going to donate to the local shelters, but I haven't gotten to it yet. Was this because I didn't have change for the man by the bus? Did I not tell the cashier to have a good day? I'm not a perfect person. I'll never say that, but I've never gone out of my way to hurt someone. If I somehow did... I'll do my best to make it up to them. Maybe my easygoing personality made me a bit of a doormat. Huh, what a way to figure out why your friends didn't care enough to show up for a party. I'm glad they didn't, so they wouldn't have to deal with the monster that was losing patience with me. I don't think you've earned an easy death. 
I was going to be kind. You won't even consider my simple request. Tell me your sins. Explain to me why someone hated you enough to request my assistance. The voice got more intense with each word. The door shook, causing me to cower as far away as possible. While I was on the floor, shaking like a leaf, I realized I really needed to clean behind the toilet more often. I swear on my life, I have no idea what you're talking about. Can't you give me a little hint? I begged, tears starting to come to my eyes. Don't you dare judge me. I bet most of you would have the same reaction. A hint. Let me help you jog your memory. The door stopped rattling for a while. I almost thought it was over, but this damn bastard has cheat codes or something. All at once, the entire room shook. The lights flickered as deafening thumping noises overtook the small space. Slowly, a black mass appeared from out of the mirror. I uselessly tossed anything nearby, which harmlessly bounced off the creature's face. It had long black hair that spilled down to the floor. Layers of a black lace veil covered the face, but two glowing eyes shone through. Long, dark arms twisted out from the mirror, pulling the rest of the body forward. I screamed and pressed myself hard against the wall. This couldn't be happening. I might be able to accept it a bit better if there was a reason I could understand as a motive for the attack. The long, sharp finger reached out stopping inches away from my face. Now, little Ryan, repent. I barely heard the words over the shaking and thudding. If I didn't, I would have been dead. My name isn't Ryan, it's Pat, I shouted. I curled into a ball, my hands gripping my hood tight over my eyes to blind myself to the horrors I faced. Don't lie to me, you. I have mail, I shouted again, sounding like a small child. Slowly, the sounds and shaking started to die down. When I felt brave enough, I carefully peeked out. Nothing but an empty bathroom. Did I have a mental breakdown? I still felt the rip in my costume, showing I must have done that to myself. If I did break for some reason, I'd almost convinced myself that was what happened. I finally stood up when the bathroom door swung open. That monster stood on the other side. The lanky body dressed in a baggy black sweater and sweatpants that he wasn't wearing before. I screamed for a few minutes. Are you? He started to ask. No, I wasn't done. I screamed one more just in case. Anyway, the creature started and lifted not only some mail, but also my ID. The jerk went through my wallet. I swear to God he took my stamped coffee cards. Do you have an address for Ryan Time? I see some of his mail here, but it looks like you're the only one who lives here, the monster said, and he sounded normal. He dropped that raspy, scary voice. In my sheer terror before, I didn't remember the person I bought this house from was named Ryan. I sometimes get his mail since he only recently moved out. Oh, yeah I do. He told me his new address to forward mail and such. Is he, is he the guy you were supposed to kill? I slowly asked. Well, all you humans look the same alright. He stopped, getting extremely defensive very quickly. He backed up to let me out of the bathroom so I could find where I wrote Ryan's address. I folded the paper, aware of red eyes on my back. I didn't want to hand over the information if that meant someone was going to die just to save my own skin. You're going to kill him, aren't you? I said. My hands started to shake. Brutally, he confirmed. I shook my head, feeling sick with fear. If I was quick, maybe I could eat the paper, or do something to save another person's life. If you must know, he killed a family of four drunk driving 
but he fled before the cops got to the scene. The creature explained calmly, I guess Ryan's time is up, get it? Because his last name is. I let the joke die. I handed the paper to the monster, more embarrassed than scared at that point. I expected my unwanted guest to leave, but he chose to hang around. It felt a bit surreal, staring down a nightmare casually standing in my kitchen. Listen, about the mix-up, this doesn't really happen with me. If it gets back to my bosses, I'll lose my monthly bonus. I have mouths to feed and all, he awkwardly said. You have kids, I replied, horrified there was more of him. Cats. I should have guessed, he seemed like a cat person. I was just glad to be alive. I didn't even know how to contact who he worked for. I needed to pretend as if I did, in case he decided to take care of some loose ends. Do you really live alone? You have a lot of soda for one person, he commented, his eyes directed to the counter. I bought some bottles and extra snacks for the party that never happened. His question was because he was worried I had a roommate might have heard what went down. I wanted to have a party, but no one showed up. I shrugged. Lame, he said. He should have just killed me. Beside that, my life was still in danger. I needed him to believe I wasn't going to tell his boss about his mix-up. If I made it as an exchange, that may work. But what on earth would I ever want from someone like him so I didn't snitch? In exchange for my silence, do you want to hang out? I offered. There was at least a full minute of silence between us. What? He asked in a way that needed him to wind up for the one word. I got all these snacks and all these movies lined up. I defended myself. You got those pumpkin cookies he said as he turned the piece of paper around between his fingers. The Pillsbury sugar cookies? I said, not knowing if he meant those or some sort of pumpkin-flavored cookies. Those bitches, was the blunt reply. I can't believe those cookies were going to save my life. I nodded, and the deal was made. Somehow, I had my party. A very awkward Halloween party, but it still counted. Turns out, the creature that looked like he belonged to a horror movie jumped at cheap moments while watching them. He also ate a lot, even though he was so thin. I made six boxes of those cookies, which he easily put away. I saw him eyeing the pumpkins which I was going to offer for him to carve if he wanted. Instead, he just ate them raw. I never saw what was under the dark veils that covered his face but I saw he tore through a large pumpkin in two bites. The jagged teeth marks made me glad I sacrificed pumpkins to save my skin. Near the end of the night, he looked ready to leave. With a stretch, he hovered by the front door. Are you gonna hand out Halloween candy? It was just weird how normal he sounded. Yeah, I don't work that night. Let me come over. I want to scare some teens after I finish this job. I rarely get to do anything that isn't disemboweling on Halloween, he admitted. Horrifying mental image, but okay, I responded. It wouldn't kill me hanging out with him again. Okay, maybe it might. To my shock, he gave me a cell phone number to reach him. I realized then I never got his name. What do I call you? I mean, do you have a name like Red Eye Ripper? I asked. Brian, Red Eye Ripper was my father's name, he said. I let myself laugh over that one. If you couldn't laugh with the inhuman monster that almost ripped you apart, then who can you joke with? I let him leave with the plan to see each other at least one more time. Sure, I didn't sleep for 48 hours after the whole experience, and I know Brian is off killing people, but it is nice to have a friend that you can hang out with. On Halloween, I might ask him if he could repair my frog costume or could pay me back for ripping it. On second thought, I'll just eat the cost.
Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that. If you have a scary story you'd like me to read on the channel, please send me an email or post it to my subreddit. You can find details of this in the video description. It's the stories that make this, and this is the best way to ensure variety in the stories I share. Thank you all for listening, and a special thanks to my channel members and patrons who now have special access to ad-free videos and other behind-the-scenes content. Once again, thank you guys for listening. Have a great night.